Okay, the session is live now, so we are recording the session at the same time. So I'll take it uh, from the P process again. Again, just assume at the back of your mind you have the figure one written and what you have to draw to complete it to make it P. Now, at the tail end of that figure one, you have what is known as analysis. At the middle, you have what is known as strategic design. And at the top of that one that you've written, you have what is known as development and testing. Again, at the tail of that one that you've written, you have analysis. The middle, you have what is known as strategic design. And at the top, you have what is known as development and testing. Development and testing. Now, please complete the two. Uh, the, the P, as though you are completing how to write your P. Complete it now. So the moment you complete it, then you have it as P. Now, what do you have at the upper part of that, the C, the mirrored C, that you use to complete that P? What do you have at the upper part of it? You have what is known as implementation and monitoring. Implementation and monitoring. And the part where you have to join the P together with that mirrored C, which is your number five, you have it as evaluation and replanning. I'll share the material at the end of the class. I'm having issues um, with uh, sharing the slide live as we are discussing as well. I think uh, it's because of the, because of my system capacity is filled already. So again, the P process, you have them in steps. Step one is analysis. Step two, you have what is known as strategic design. Step three, you have development and testing. Step four, you have implementation and monitoring. And step five, you have evaluation and replanning. Again, you have step one, analysis. Step two, strategic design. Step three, development and testing. Step four, implementation and monitoring. And step five, evaluation and replanning. Now we have to look at each and every one of this, which is your analysis followed by your strategic design, followed by development and testing, implementation and monitoring, and evalu evaluation and replanning. Your communication strategically itself requires a clearly defined strategy with specific goals established in advance. Meaning this is what we intend to achieve at the end of the day, just like uh, what we discussed in our ACADA model class. There is something that the development communication team or the NGO set to achieve this is our goal at the end of the day same thing is equally expected of the p process so the pre process itself is a framework designed to guide communication professionals as they develop strategic communication programs you need a guide so um, uh, for the sake of the class it is imperative to know that you can make use of any of this process any of this model to solve or to you can deploy any of it for your development communication uh, goals for your development communication team or NGOs or wherever you find yourself making use of DEFCOM. So you can make use of any of it. The, which it the, now depends on whichever one you feel will be more comfortable for you or will be more suitable for the intervention that you intend to do. So this step by step roadmap leads communication professionals from a loosely defined concepts about changing behavior to a strategic and participatory program with a measurable impact on the intended audience. We always have an intended audience. This rural community is going to be our audience for this program or for this intervention. When we are talking about bad roads in, um, in Lagos, we'll be thinking about places like, um, uh, okay, don't let us look at bad roads. Let us look at uh, intervention programs for, for rural communities, particularly child malnutrition then you can look for a particular environment and ensure that your message or the process you are using is intended for them and it should have a measurable impact on them so the p process is used to develop communication programs addressing a wide range of topics such as encouraging safer sexual behavior in order to prevent hiv transmission promoting child survival reducing maternal mortality increasing contraceptive prevalence, preventing infectious diseases, or promoting environmental health. So the Health Communication Partnership, also known as HCP, 
equally helps they equally make use of this uh, p process to address family planning issues to address maternal health to address child survival uh, hiv and aids and other infectious diseases such as malaria and tuberculosis so we call it use of the health communication partnership also known as hcps and deploy p process to it for programs which are designed to initiate positive change across three broad domains within social political environment, in health service delivery system, and among communities and individuals. So it's it's way it's it's even broader. And mostly in, in, in most cases, when we start talking about attitudinal change, uh, when we deploy the speed change we must have first done what is known as analysis we'll still get there just like what we did in academic model our situation report we should have it at hand before we start analyzing each and every one of those things first it if if i don't have a dick and you are trying to sell to me paracetamol i'm likely to tell you i'm not buying if i'm not having malaria and you are telling me to go and buy a matem or, or amala and all the malaria uh, 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 drugs. I'm going to tell you, uh, I, I, I'm, I don't have malaria, so you don't expect me to start using something that I'm not suffering from. So first, we need to identify that people are having this problem before we can now say, OK, there is a need for an intervention. And when we want to intervene, these are the processes that we need to follow, or this is the model that we need to deploy in order to, for us to be able to have uh, a, a successful intervention with, with quality or 100% efficacy on the people. So the P process is key to designing uh, successful communication strategies uh, to strengthen public health worldwide, worldwide. So used, uh, it is often also used successfully among the world to design health communication programs. And this has been done since years like 1982 and so on. So the original P process has now been revised over the years to reflect better better both the goals of HCP and the overall evolution in the field of development communication or in the field of strategic communication in the past decade. Now, I'll take that is just to give us an insight into what P process is about. And again, the P process is about participation and capacity strengthening. Participation and capacity strengthening. These are some of the things we use the P process for. These two concepts, which are participation and capacity strengthening, uh, appear throughout the, uh, uh, a revision because they are considered essential to building strong partnership and coalitions from the international and national to the local and community level. Wherever you are deploying intervention or uh, wherever, uh, wh whatever community you've chosen to say this community is what uh, this community has been selected and this is the uh, thing, uh, this this is the problem we've identified, and this is our own method of intervening, or in, uh, this is our own intervention for this community in order for them to be able to survive for a very long period of uh, of time on Earth. So both concepts are also crucial to increase sustainability of program effort and outcomes. So when we look when we look at P process as well, uh, it, it takes expanded what is known as expanded analysis. Although the first one we talked about, the first step, the first strategy we talked about has to do with analysis. But in this topic, we'll be looking at it from the revised P process. We divide step one, which is uh, the analysis itself, into what is known as situation analysis and a communication and audience analysis. We need to understand the basics. We need to analyze the current situation on ground. After understanding, after having our reports, just like we do in Academic Model here, we need to analyze the situation. And aside from analyzing the situation, we equally need to analyze our communication. How best are we to relate to these people? We need to analyze it better. Are we making use of infographs? What channel is best suitable for us to be able to communicate with those people effectively? And we equally need to analyze our audience. While analyzing the audience, then it's as good as saying we are equally analyzing the communication. I'm going to the north to 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 have an inter uh, to to be the team lead of an intervention program. Let's take for instance. Um, uh, there is one thing that is obtainable in the north, and that is child marriage, uh, where a child of uh, a, a teen of don't even let me use teen uh, a child of 12 years old, 13, 
14 now, the teens involved now, 15, 16, getting married to elderly ones as, as um, uh, with, with the, with the, within the age bracket of 45 to 50 to 60 and so on. Now, the right intervention here is to sensitize the people over there. I am a Yoruba man. If I'm going there, I need to do what is known as situation analysis and equally what is known as communication and audience analysis. What is their culture? What are their, what are their basic beliefs? If I'm going there to speak all this English, I'm speaking. Uh, I was an, an average Aosa man will only look at me and say, Kai, Akoi Turenchi, what? You've been speaking only English since far. We don't understand. So in part of part of our communication analysis should include speaking their own local dialect, speaking their own uh, their own language. So as for them to be able to understand that what, what whatever this uh, intervention these people are bringing to us or bringing before us, then we need to believe in it or probably subscribe to it. As much as there's been loads of intervention over the years on early child marriage, uh, the, 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 the percentage is even here to reduce in the north. So we need to understand the situation analysis and communication and audience analysis. The third one we'll be looking at is emphasis on community and process. And step three, the revised process, P process, underscores the need for participatory processes and the facilitation of group action to address health issues. Let me run that by you again. In step three, the revised P process underscores the need for participatory process and the facilitation of group action to address health issues. Meaning as an intervention team or a development communication team that looks forward to eradicating a critical issue in a particular rural community. We shouldn't do all of this in isolation, do the planning and uh, communication analysis in isolation and assume for those that are affected, which are our audience, but rather we should ensure that some of those things we intend to give them are participatory in nature. We should involve them. They should be part of it. If we don't involve them, at the end of the day, they don't see it as their own, but rather they see it as it is your own. You are only trying as much as possible to force us into your own belief. So immediately you are gone, that will be the end of that program or that will be the end of that intervention. But when you carry them along and you ensure there is some level of participation from them, you recruit amongst them to be part of the team, you involve their village heads or uh, the head that they, ha they have in that community, then they don't see it as your own, they see it as our own. And the next one is implementation and monitoring which is our step four of the P process. The P uh, of the P is a larger, is larger to indicate the relative significance of the step in any program. When you don't implement your program, then it's as good as you've done only what we have in our project. When we write our project in our undergraduate days, we often write between from chapters one to three. And in our chapter one, introduction, chapter two, uh, we have our literature review and chapter three is where we have our research methodology. Now, when you stop at your research method methodology and you say you are done with your project, my dear brother and sisters, you are yet to even start. The work, the real work is yet to start because what you've only done is the preamble. Meaning if you conduct everything here between your step one to step three and you leave it at, at that, you've only done your, your, your underground work. The implementation is missing. Your implementation, just like uh, relating it to your project, has to do with where you analyze your data. So the implementation is where you bring everything to bear, where you bring it to life, where you bring it to action. There's a big difference between somebody who writes a song and another person will decide to go and sing the song and at the same time promote it. What the difference between the two of them is that one had written it and kept it had, uh, on that under its pillow the other one that decided to go and record it and at the same time promote it now it becomes something of of, of uh, wider acceptability so implementation and aside from implementing some of this program you equally need to monitor it and that was why we we're, were making reference to our impact and outcome indicators under our CADAM model what we said the impact has to do with your uh, medium term while the outcome has to do with long term so you have to monitor some of this progress as well and the next one we have to look at is your management and feedback so the original pre-process linked management uh, uh, to implementation and monitoring in step four meaning we can say management and feedback are equally part of the implementation and monitoring. So in this revised version, management is no longer exclusively presented as part of the fourth step. 
because it is central to and in fact in all steps of the communication programming process meaning at all step at all in all of the steps from step one to two to three to four and the fact and the fifth one which is analysis or strategic design management and feedback has a role to play so management and feedback have both have a role to play because you have to monitor each and every one of these things you have to manage it and you need to get immediate feedback not long-term feedback you need to get immediate feedback from the audience i equally need to get immediate feedback from the team and the next one which is uh return to analysis of strategic design the original pre-process completed the circle of p by bringing step five which is impact evaluation back to design stage so the revision here allows us allows communication professionals allows communication uh, professionals to use impact evaluations and when we say impact evaluation uh, i want to believe we all understand uh, the meaning of impact evaluation impact evaluation which uh, gives us the opportunity of monitoring at mid, uh, medium term back to the design stage. So this revision allows communication professionals to use impact evaluation, which uh, results to return to either the design stage, if expanding or revising existing programs, or to, anal uh, to the analysis stage, if developing new programs. Now I'll take, this is me just giving us a brief on what each and every one of this stage is all about. Now let us, try as much as possible to expand it. But before we do that, I want to ensure I'm not the only one doing the talking. I want to believe each and every one of us is uh, probably jotting one or two things. Can someone do a recap of what we've been saying to since? Anyone at all, please. The floor is open or you have the floor, please. It seems I'm the only one talking here. Shall I start calling names? Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, from what I've been able to uh, jot down here about the P process, uh, it's just as if, uh, just as we write our normal P, letter P. And the letter P for P process uh, features five major uh, points. From the bottom, which is the down part of the figure one that, that stands alone before the, the curve uh, is added to it. The bottom, the bottom of the P is for um, analysis, while the, the middle of the figure one can, is used for strategic uh, design. While the top of the figure one that we are at the standing alone is used for development and testing. So at the curve, the first part of the curve, which is added to figure one, is used, uh, is mentioned as implementation and monitoring. While the last part of the OP process is called uh, evaluation and replanning. Uh, the P process is a public relations strategy which is used for strategic uh, communication. It is one key uh, uh, um, communication strategy that is very participatory and it um, and, and is all about our capacity um, strengthening. Uh, thank you. All right, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ridwan. Is you won't be the one to do the talking because we'll have to do this every step of the way. So the next thing we'll be looking at here for our P process is um, analysis, which is the first one, step one, analysis. Analysis is the first step in developing effective communication programs. But this step does not need to be long and detailed if the program is built upon well-documented past experiences. So program staff need to understand, when I make use of the word program staff, I'm uh, referring to members or team, uh, the intervention team that are coming together to uh, to provide us intervention for any choosing our rural community at all. They need to understand the problem, the people, their culture, 
existing policies and programs, active organizations, and available communication channels. So usually much of the situation analysis is available from demographic, epidemiological and sociological, epidemiological, sociological, and economic studies. And access to such data will speed up the steps below. Meaning when we are running our analysis, we need to understand those we are dealing with. As members of the intervention team, we need to understand the problem. We need to understand the people that are involved. We need to understand their culture. I've given an example of this uh, an intervention team in the North uh, on uh, early child marriage. We need to understand their existing policies and programs. If there are policies that support this already, or are there programs that promote some of these things already? In Kwara State here, yeah, there are some town where, as much as we often have marriages in Lagos every Saturday, uh, you have families, Tokwe, Chugoze, Uks, Tokwe, Ade, Uks, Chioma, and so on. That's the way we have it in Lagos. In Kwara State here, yeah, they, uh, there are some communities that don't do that. Even if you are based in Lagos, if you want to have your proper marriage, traditional way, you rather come down or come up here in Kwara State and then do what is known as a group marriage. One, there is an existing policy in support of that. As a matter of fact, they don't see it as marriage, they see it as a festival. There's a, there's a, there's a policies in, in support of that and there are programs that are equally aiding this. At the end of the day, you even find out that uh, uh, companies like uh, MTN, Etel or even Globalcom are in support of some of this. And this is you doing your analysis. So if there are no existing policies, you equally have to take note of this at the analysis level. And then we look at the active organizations that are equally part of this. That's why I made use of MTN as an example. Available communication channels. Which of these channels have been used before? Which one are you bringing on board? So usually some of the situation analysis is available from demographics that is uh, members of the community of the of the of the respondent or members of the audience that you intend to bring this intervention to they are likely to give you some of this analysis give you information about it when we look at it for the from the epidemiological and social uh, sociological and economic studies as well if they are available and if such data is readily available, then it's minimized the stress that you have to, to go through when you are doing your analysis. So we'll look at under the P process. We have uh, some major things to look at. And don't forget, I said under our analysis earlier, on, we have to do what is known as audience and uh, communication analysis. And in the course of running your, or doing your analysis, you need to conduct what is known as a situation analysis. So conduct a situation analysis will help results in an in-depth description of the major problem or the major developmental problem being addressed. So you, when you do your analysis, you understand what they are going through, you understand the problem, you understand where they are coming from, you understand the policies that are even guiding some of their problems, you understand their beliefs, their basic or religious beliefs that are guiding whatever thing they believe in which is why they are doing what they are doing that is affecting them towards development. And in the course of running this your situation analysis, you need to equally determine, determine the severity and cause of the problems by reviewing existing health and demographic data, survey results, study findings, and any other information available on the problem. So a, a group of uh, development communication team shouldn't just be, uh, uh, rely on the information these people are ready to give you. Should you call it, probably consult uh, consult uh, NGOs that are equally contributed to the same at the same intervention in such community. Uh, uh, consult uh, existing data, uh, data uh, existing database, uh, survey results, study findings, and so on. Secondly, equally when doing your situation analysis, you need to identify factors in the beating or facilitating desired changes. By, uh, by considering the basic, so, uh, the basic social, cultural, and economic challenges facing the people the, and, and how the program that you want to do as a form of intervention will be able to tackle this. In the north where they are, where they are engaged in what is known as um, early child marriage, they have what is known as a cultural belief about it. So 
if you want to tackle this, you have to go and nip it from the body itself. So as to know how, uh, by, by, by understanding, we'll still get there when we start talking about policies. Who are those, who are the policy makers? I think uh, uh, Sanusi Lamido, Sanusi, try as much as possible to eradicate the rate at which people only just give birth in the north and then leave them, turn these young lads to Almagiris. It's because they have a cultural belief towards it. And because of you uh, identifying this, these are the factors that is likely to inhibit or facilitate the desired change that you are expecting. Another thing you should look out for when running your situation analysis on that process is to develop a problem statement. You need to get this done. Develop a problem statement. Uh, now do you do this? You develop a clear statement that sums up the problems to be addressed. Develop a problem statement that sums up the problems to be addressed. And the next is carry out formative research. Carry out formative research. And how do you, I'll go back to develop a, a problem statement. How do you uh, develop a problem statement? I gave uh, a clue on how to get this done. It's a code I've been using for quite some time, uh, time now to, to write problem statements effectively. And there is no journal that I get to submit my paper. Once they read my problem statement, I can at least 60%, I can be rest assured this paper is going to be accepted. And we do this by making you by ensuring that we look at it from the ideal situation of the problem, the current situation, what are the measures that have been put to place, uh, despite the measures that have been put to place, uh, what is the level of its persistence, and then we look at the effects, we look at the research that have been conducted. Has there been any other NGOs that have come? uh to bring about this chain developmental chain to this community uh what has hindered or inhibited uh, what are the factors that have inhibited their their uh inhibited the efficacy of their intervention and then I start looking out for the gaps that if social ngo had done this and another ngo had done this government agency had done this then something is missing what are they yet to do so these are some of the things we have to put into into place when we are doing what is known as a problem when we are developing a problem statement mm -hmm. and the last one is carry out formative research and in carrying out your formative research you need to listen to to understand the audience's needs you just don't go to them with what you have in your head you have to understand their needs at some point uh, i read this i have someone's story online on on twitter as uh, the person uh, is is into all those developmental programs here and there and I decided to go to Makoko area in Lagos to give them uh, potable water by, by, by drilling bowls. And the first thing they told him is, oh, guy, you can't do that here. You have to go and see the ballet. And when he went to the ballet, he had, he had the, the mindset of spending at least almost, I think, 1.4, 1.6 million era. And the members of the community, the senior members of the community were requesting for quite a ridiculous amount of money before he could embark on such project. Don't forget, this project is for them. It is not for the guy. Does he, he is not having the intention of drilling a borehole in Makoko because it is closer to the uh, to, to 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 water, so as to have enough water at home. But rather, the project is for them, and they are still billing him. What he had failed to do from the onset is to understand the audience's needs. What exactly do you need in this community? Had it been he had done all of this in his analysis, then they are likely to tell him, see, my, my dear brother, we don't need water. We know where to fetch good and pot, uh, potable water, quality uh, potable water that we can drink at home. But this one you are bringing to us, we are not interested in it. Why don't you channel your intervention to towards uh, Healthcare. This is what we need. Our, our, our wives or our, our, our mothers will have to travel out of Makoko before they're able to give birth to, to, to children. This is what we, we need to meet with this audience so that they can tell us their needs and tell us their own priorities. This is what we need for now. In Konto Konlono Wadi. So secondly, when carrying out your formative research, you need to conduct baseline research both quantitative and qualitative you can't go you just go, don't go to places like that to share questionnaires and then they fill and then you go back that is one of the worst method of doing research here in africa because we as individuals don't even believe it if people share flyers in and out of unilag sometimes we only feel it for feeling sake because we don't want to embarrass the person sharing the questionnaire but one of the best ways 
uh, we 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 have it in uh, in a uh, philosophical assumption of re uh, philosophical is it philosophical assumption of research uh, where we have two different school of thoughts. Okay, philosophical assumption of research will be looking at epistemology, ontology, and axiology. Uh, or when we look at it from the two different school of thought that has to do with research, conducting research for quantitative and qualitative, we'll be looking at it from the post-positivist and the interpretivist school of thought. Those that are into the post-positivist, those ones believe in what is known as um, uh, conducting uh, quantitative research. They believe in conducting quantitative research rather than going out there to conduct qualitative research. Because uh, while those who are uh, interpretive school of thought to tell you, please, I want to conduct a qualitative research, it allows me to be able to probe further. If we give them questionnaire to fill for our P process, uh, deploying, uh, uh, deploying P process for developmental purpose or developmental intervention, and you're giving them questionnaire, it can work that way. It can be that effective because they will only feel if you're asking them male or female, female, do you have a portable water in your environment? No. If you have the option of yes or no, they only take no. There is no probing question that will probe that no further. That will, but for qualitative, it allows you to be able to probe further, which is why the interpretive school of thought believe in their own school of thought, in their own type of research, uh, form of research, and that uh, research uh, uh, design. And that is why they tell you qualitative is the best because it allows them to establish what is current their current status and they, it allows them to be able to dig deep into their head and get required results so the last one when carrying out this formative research it allows you to equally establish the current status and accurately measure the program's progress and final impact i'm not saying administering questionnaire is not good but for you to have a quality one a quality uh, uh research that is uh, measurable, that is reliable and valid enough, then you have to make use of the mixed method, which is the use of quantitative and qualitative. And when you are mixing as well, please be very careful. Don't uh, just say because we are to mix, we will now be making use of interview and then focus group at the same time. What you are doing at that point is, is to triangulate. So I don't want to go into much details on that for now. So, and that is it for uh, our normal analysis of the situation now let us look at the audience and communication analysis from the overall situation analysis you are equally expected when using your p process to carry out a detailed audience and communication analysis and how do you do this you do this by conducting a participation analysis you do it by conducting what a participation analysis so at the national and international level uh, identify partners. You have to identify partners. You have to identify uh, allies uh, to help initiate policy change and strengthen communication interventions. And at the community level, segment the primary, secondary, and tertiary audiences and identify field workers or change agents. When you are doing what is known as um, participation analysis, you need to, number one, segment this audience. Who are those that are, my, that are my primary audience? Are they the children? That will be the key benefactors of this intervention program. If it's about good, uh, uh, if it's about portable water, are they going to be the long-term beneficiary of it? Then you classify them to be your primary. Your secondary could be the teen or those who are the working class that you know they always need that good water in the morning before they go, go to work and come back to still meet it. While the tertiary audience can actually be those 65 and above, the aged uh, ones. So you equally need to identify the field workers amongst them. Who are those that are artisans? So by uh, because at the end of the day, when you decide to come up with this, your ball hole that you want to build uh, for them, then you can bring someone from outside. Those that are in-house, that are inside our community, you need to engage them. So there should be a form of what? Participation analysis. You ask questions. Do you have bricklayers amongst you? Do you have plumbers amongst you? Do you have so-so and so amongst you? Who are those that are likely to be key beneficiaries of this? From the primary to secondary, tertiary, and so on. So the next one is to carry out what is known as a social and behavioral analysis. You carry out a social and behavioral analysis. And how do you do this? You assess knowledge. You assess knowledge. 
We look out for their attitudes, their skills, and behaviors of participants at the individual level by using what is known as data from formative research and additional in-depth studies, if required. So identifying the social networks, uh, social cultural norms, collective efficacy and community dynamics, which includes leadership patterns at the community level. When you're doing your social and behavioral analysis, you need to understand those you are dealing with. And speaking of social, it has to do with the families in that environment. It has to do with the youth. It has to do with the community members, uh, the community heads. What are their, what is the level of their knowledge? What is the level of their education? What is their attitude towards the intervention that you are bringing? What are the skills that have been given to them? If there are none, then you have to bring something on board. What are their behaviors when they hear about this new intervention you are bringing? And you have to do this at the individual level using data from formative research. If there are existing formative uh, 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 data already, if there are none, then you have to conduct one. And you need to ensure if required. So, and you equally need to identify the social network, the social cultural norms around them and their collective efficacy. When they come together, are they able to do something together and achieve it? And what are their dynamics? What are their differences? In this community, we have Yorubas. In this community, we have the Igbiras. In this community, we have the Nupes. In this community, we have the Takwas and so on. You need to understand their dynamics. You need to understand their uh, orientation as well. And you equally need to understand their leadership style and their leadership pattern. And the next rule you have to uh, look out for when you do your communication and uh, audience analysis is access communication and training needs. Analyze their, audio, their, their, their media use and assess it. This is how best to communicate to these people. So it allows you to be able to do what? Strengthen your capacity as well. So the capacity strengthening needs of what? Of their local media of what uh, of their traditional I media when you strengthen your own capacity you by you strengthen your capacity by knowing the type of material of communication to design for them that will be effective enough for them it, uh, when you when you design this you have to you you decide whether or not to make use of their local media for those of them that are already use all their traditional media or their terrestrial media for those of them that are already using the go tv and the likes you can go as far as advertising on their most watched channel on that uh, uh, type of media. So NGOs and communication agencies that had come before, you, you, you get their training materials, the ones that they have used, compare it to what you are bringing on board. And then uh, so, so as to ensure that your communication and, uh, and audience analysis is effective, it allows you to be able to have more than enough details at hand. The next step we'll be looking at is strategic design. Strategic design, strategic design. So, and speaking of strategic design, every communication program or project needs what is known as a strategic design. And they have certain steps that you have to follow. They all have steps that you have to follow. And I'll have to list the step first. Number one, establish communication objectives. The number two step is to develop program approaches and positioning. Number three, determine channels. Number four, draw up an implementation plan number five develop a monitoring and evaluation plan let me run that by you again when you're doing your strategic design you have to take certain strategies into uh, put certain, certain certain steps into place number one establish communication objectives number two develop program approaches and positioning number three determine channels Number four, draw up an implementation plan. And number five, develop a monitoring and evaluation plan. I'll have to take us back from where we are coming, which is our step one. So that's for those of us that are jotting, we have uh, key points on what we've been discussing since uh, about uh, analysis, which is our step one. Under your analysis, you need to do two things, situation analysis, and what is known as communication and audience analysis. Again, for your step one, which is analysis, you need to do two types of analysis, conduct two types of analysis here, or, or do two types of analysis here. Situation analysis, which is your number one, and then you do what is known as communication audience analysis. Now, for under what you have under your situation analysis, what are the steps 
to take when doing your situation analysis. Number one, determine severity and causes of problems. Determine severity and causes of problems. Number two, identify factors in the beating or facilitating desired changes. Identify factors in the beating or facilitating desired changes. Number three, develop a problem statement. Develop a problem statement. And number four, carry out formative research. Carry out formative research. And the next that you'll be doing, which is known as audience and communication analysis, which is your number two, you have to take the following steps as well. Number one step you have to take on that audience or communication analysis is to conduct a participation analysis. Conduct a participation analysis. Number two, carry out a social and behavioral analysis. Social or behavioral analysis, which is your, that's your number two. On that audience and communication analysis, number three, assess communication and training needs. Assess communication and training needs. Now we're going to the next one, which is um, step two, which is strategic design. I've listed the steps that you have to take when doing your strategic design, coming up with your strategic design. Number one, which I said, is to establish communication objectives. I will still go back to academic model because they are quite related when it comes to establishing communication objectives. You have to make use of the SMART formula, like I said. Set objectives that are specific. When you're establishing a communi your communication objectives, you have to set, up, set, your object uh, set the objectives that are specific, measurable, appropriate, realistic, and time-bound. By being specific, you know what you're doing measurable is this thing achievable then you need to ensure it is appropriate it is realistic don't just uh leave it leave the intervention to be fictional it's still fictional when you are still at your uh planning stage still running your analysis and so on or you're still talking about it before you even go to the field at all then it's still fictional but when you are about executing it, ensure it is realistic and it is time bound. And that is the acronym SMART. So, in course of establishing communication objectives, select key audience segments and quantify the changes in knowledge. Quantify the changes in their attitudes. Quantify the changes in their skills. Quantify the changes in their behavior. Quantify the changes in their policies. Quantify the changes in a process changes uh, which is expected within a specific time bound, uh, time frame. So again, when establishing communication objectives, you need to set your objectives and ensure that it is smart. And aside from ensuring that it is smart, you need to select your key audience segment and quantify the changes in knowledge, attitude, skills, behaviors, policies or process changes expected within a specific time frame. When you're selecting key audience segment and quantifying the changes in knowledge, you need to quantify it to say, is this thing, this intervention that we brought to them, is it commensurate with the knowledge that we have shared with them so far? In terms of attitude, this intervention that we brought to them, has it changed their attitude towards that same thing? If it's about um, uh, contracting HIV AIDS and and uh, other sexually transmitted diseases, the intervention of us having to tell them to abstain, to make use of condom, to make use of this and that, the intervention we brought to them, has it changed their attitude or they still believe in their old ways? And if the intervention has to do with uh, uh, educating them or ensuring they, they, they acquire one skill or the other, has it influenced them in terms of skill acquisition and have they been able to make use of it over time? Okay, I think Mr. Augusta Okun has a question, or is this a mistake? Someone is raising up his hand. Okay, I guess I have to just go on with the class. So the next one we have to look at is develop program approaches and positioning. 
program approaches and positioning. And how do you do this? You have to do this by selecting a behavior change model upon which to base the program. An example of such model is your ACADA model. Okay, I'm basing this program on this model. I'm basing this program on two-step flow model. I'm basing this program on health belief model. So explicitly state the assumption underlying the basic strategy and approach. You equally need to explain why and how the program is expected to change health behavior. You have to state this clearly. And you equally need to position the program clearly to benefit the audience. Next we'll look at is determine channels. And when you determine channels, you have to consider a coordinated multimedia approach for synergistic impact. A coordinated multimedia approach for synergistic impact. Meaning you have to decide which type of media am I to make use of? Which channel am I to make use of to reach out to people to be, bring about this attitudinal change or this health belief change? Where possible, you can achieve scale by including mass media as well, tied to the community mobilization and interpersonal communication among family, friends, community, social network, and service providers. You can engage their local media. Uh, gone are the days when Lagos State is flooded, is added quite a lot of uh, radio stations today. When you decide to tune in, you'll be, you find not less than over 28, 27 radio stations still coming up, and there are some that are still coming up. Unlike some communities around us here in Kwara State, where they tell you this radio station is owned by the community, meaning it cannot travel far. It is only with people living within that community that will make use of it. And when you are bringing an intervention program to them, you have to make use of that their own local uh, uh, or that their own local uh, their their own community media. So where it is possible, you can achieve this skill by making use of their own mass media as well. And the next, you draw up an implementation plan. How do you do this? You do this by developing a work schedule with regular benchmarks to monitor progress, or what is known as regular milestone to monitor progress. To between two, three days, we want to do this. Just like us doing our to-do list. By four o'clock, I want to do this. By six o'clock, I want to do this. At the end of the day, we might end up doing only two or three out of six that we highlighted. But at least we, it has shown that we've been able to do something meaningful for that day. So we monitor, we, when, 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 implement, when drawing up our implementation pro, uh, plan, we develop a work schedule with regular benchmarks or milestone to monitor our progress and prepare a line item budget. Prepare a line item budget. Between so, so and so time, this is the amount I'll be spending. And you have to complete a management plan, including partners' roles and responsibilities. Make sure all involved know what is expected meaning everybody in that team has to be carried along. You equally need to carry along your part, those that are partnering with you, if they are NGOs, in, if they are government agencies, if they are non-governmental agencies as well. You need an uh, uh, organization, which is your NGOs. You need to ensure you, you carry them along every step of the way, every milestone that you intend to achieve. They should be part of it. And the last one here, uh, under uh, uh, strategic design, you need to develop a monitoring and evaluation plan. And how do you do this? By identifying indicators and data sources to monitor program implementation as well as audience reaction to it. So we've been able to achieve this in the next, uh, so far for the past three months. What is the reaction of our audience towards this, our achievement? And you equally need to select the study design to measure process outcomes and access impacts. I want to believe when we mention outcomes and impacts, we all understand the meaning. So by doing this, we can say, yes, you are able to cover what is known as your strategic plan. Uh, number three, which is development and testing. Developing concepts, materials, messages, stories, and participatory processes combine science and art. This not only must be guided by the analysis and strategic design in steps one and two, but also must be creative to evoke emotion that motivates audiences. Let me reiterate that again. When you develop, when you're uh, under your development and testing, you have to develop your concepts, you have to develop your materials, you have to develop the messages, the stories, and the participatory processes 
uh, combine, which combines science and art. So this would not on, uh, this not only must be guided by the analysis and strategic design in steps one and two, meaning when you are designing all of this or developing your concepts, materials, and so on, it must be guided by what you have in your step one and your step two, which is your uh, uh, strategic uh, design and what is known as your situation analysis or communication and audience analysis. You have to put them into cognizance when you are in your step three which is development and testing and what are the things that you have in your development and testing what are the things that we have in development and testing number one you have to develop number two tests number three revise and number four retest again number one develop number two tests number three revise and number four retest but this step may involve the development of guidelines. Now I'm looking at, let us take it one after the other, which is develop. When you develop, when you are developing, this is a step or this step itself may involve the development of guidelines, the development of tools, the development of your toolkits possibly including facilitation manuals for group interaction or training manuals for counseling, job aids for service providers, and interactive internet process, TV or radio scripts, educational comic books, and any, or, any number of other interventions. So involve key stakeholders, managers, field workers, and members of the audience in design workshops to ensure that the end product meets their needs. So when you are developing, you have to take in, uh, in, uh, put at the back, you have to, you need to have it at the back of your mind that quite a lot of things you'll be bringing to train these people. You have to develop it yourself. I'm not saying you have to, if you are, if you are taking, if you intend to, to give a particular community a ball, you have to be the one to go and get the drilling machine and so on. No, but you have to meet with the companies that will come and drill it for you. And you need to carry everybody along. Your facilitation manuals as well. You will be the one you, you have to delegate when you're doing your facilitation manuals. Because uh, your facilitation manuals uh, gives room for what is known as interaction, group interaction. Which is why you have those that are constructing roads. Sometimes they bring out all these big maps to tell you this is where we are today. This is the part we are yet to cover. These are some of the things that you need to do. Or what is known as aside from uh, facilitation manuals you need to have them as training manuals for counseling particularly you cancel those uh, that are your your artisans you cancel those that are to be part of the project so and this 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 includes um aside from uh, counseling these people you equally need to have an interactive internet process this is the way we have to communicate are we to make use of this type of uh, communication software? If anyone has anything to write, you can make use of this uh, 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 Google Meet to communicate. When we meet at night because of distance and so many other things, this is the channel for us to, 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 to talk. If you equally need to go on radio or you need to go to the media to sensitize the people about the intervention, you equally need to develop your TV and radio script as well. If you are to meet with kids in that environment for that intervention, to educate them on certain things that you, uh, certain, uh, to educate them on critical issues that could affect them or hinder their own growth, then you need to go with uh, the, with the uh, educational comic books. And these educational comic books must be developed by you or any other forms of intervention at all. So and in the course of developing, you equally need to involve key stakeholders such as your managers, your field workers, and members of the audience. Those that are going to be the beneficiaries, you equally need to involve them in your, your uh, in designing some of these things. So you, you, do, you involve them because in, uh, you, you involve them because you need to ensure that whatever you are designing or whatever you are developing, whatever you're bringing to them, caters for their own needs. And the next one we have to look at is tests. When you test, test concepts with stakeholders and representatives of the audience to be reached. Test concepts with stakeholders, 
and representatives of the audience to be reached. So, and when you do this, uh, you, you, when you are testing, uh, you equally need to follow concept testing with in-depth pre-testing of materials, messages, and process with primary, secondary, and tertiary audiences. By pre-testing it with each and every one of them, you'll be able to get how and each and every one of them get to think about the intervention you are bringing on board. And in the course of your implementation, you'll be able to put this to use, to say, okay, uh i'm trying to come up with an example if you are if you are to test we test basically for two things validity of um of 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 what we want to do for them and how reliable it's going to be at the end of the day so and this testing and pre-testing has to be in-depth and i'll give an example of having to conduct survey having to conduct qualitative re uh, research and get feedback results to partners and allies to ensure maximum ownership and use. So when you gather all of this information after testing and pre-testing, you equally need to give feedback to those that are contributing to that intervention, to that course. They might be partners, they might be NGOs, they might be your allies, in order to ensure maximum ownership and use. So at the end of the day, we all can come together to say, we are the owner of this intervention. We are the ones that did this. Both the beneficiaries who are equally the stake, major stakeholders uh, or the major audience and we that are equally contributing to the intervention. And the next is revise. Make changes based on pre-test results for messages, stories or participatory processes that are not understood correctly, not remembered or are not socially or culturally acceptable. When you are testing, in the course of your testing, there are some people that will tell you color red is not our own thing. So please, uh, we we'll advise you go and use another color. So you have to be forced to go back. So and when you are going back, it means you decide to go and revise all of those contents. All of those contents. And when you revise, it allows you to be able to make key changes in it. So it allows you to make changes based on the pre-test results. Based on the pre-test results, for messages, for stories that you shared with them in terms of colors, in terms of their content, in terms of even their own traditional belief. So at the revised level, they tell you what is culturally acceptable to them or socially acceptable to them and what is not. So on the next one, which is what? Retest. When you're retesting, you retest material. After revising, then you have to take it back to them. You retest the material to ensure revisions are done well and make final adjustments before replication, printing, or final production. Meaning, when you are developed, don't forget, we start with developing. First, you develop all of this. Second, you have to test them. Third, you revise. And four, you retest these materials to ensure that revisions are done very well and make final adjustments before, uh, before, before you replicate them, before you print them, or you do, before you do your final production for the materials that you want to use uh, uh, to, to, to sensitize them on the intervention. Now, let me relate this, your uh, step three for you, which is development and testing. It is just like your research instrument, your questionnaire. And in your chapter three, you have a place where they will tell you you have to do what is known as validity and reliability. Here at Summit University, there's a way we run our validity and reliability. Some will tell you to do what is known as face validity which we can allow it to pass at undergrad level. But at um, uh, master's level, you still have to do some level of validity as well. But for reliability, you need to subject it to a statistical package for social sciences, your SPSS, and ensure that the, the, the material that you, are, you want to test. Now, when we are testing, we conduct what is known as pilot test. And the material you are testing should, uh, achieves what is known as, uh, achieves a Kronbach alpha of 0.70. The minimum we can accept is 0 0.60. Now, when you get to the field and you notice that the material you are testing or the questionnaire you are testing doesn't achieve that, it has to achieve Kronbach Alpha because, but it, uh, because of the reliability. It becomes reliable only when you, yeah, when only when you take the material, uh, the questionnaire to the same respondent over and over again, and you are getting the same answer. So when you achieve, uh, when you do not achieve. Kronbach Alpha 0.7, let's assume you are achieving, you achieved minus one, uh, minus uh, point so so and so, point one, two, four, and so, and so on, very low to 
to uh, Chromebook account 5.70, then it means you have to revise the questionnaire. And after you're done revising it, then you do what is known as retest. You have to retest it. At, uh, by the time you now retest it with the hope now that, yes, you've been able to, what, if it now meets your, your Chromebook and uh, expected Chromebook offer, then you can now decide to go and print for your final uh, uh, respondent, depending on the numbers. Uh, they are. And then step four we'll be looking at is implementation and monitoring. Implementation and monitoring. Implementation emphasizes maximum participation, flexibility, and training. While monitoring involves tracking output to be sure that all activities take place as planned and potential problems are promptly addressed. Let me re reiterate that again. Implementation emphasizes maximum participation, flexibility, and training. While monitoring involves tracking output to be sure that all activities take place as planned and potential problems are promptly addressed. And how do you do this? You need to take certain steps when you are implementing and monitoring. And what are the steps that you have to take? And these are step four is number one, produce and disseminate. Produce and disseminate. So when you produce and disseminate, you have to develop and implement a dissemination plan. That may include local government, NGOs, the private sectors as appropriate, and the media for the maximum coverage. If I'm producing, am I involving the local government to help disseminate? Are they to, to equally help me be a part of this in disseminating this information towards the intervention that we, we intend to do? Am I partnering with uh, NGOs? Am I involving private sectors? Am I equally involving the media for maximum or a wider coverage? Step two, uh, the, 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 the step two you have to take in implementation and monitoring is train trainers and field workers. Train trainers and field workers. So plan for training at all levels. You don't only just train those that are working with you or working as part of your team, your C4D uh, team towards an intervention. You need to train everybody along the way, those that you find necessary to train, that you know they are opinion leaders or they are, they are, they are decision makers. So uh, when you begin with training of trainers, which is TOT, provide continued opportunities for more training. You just don't stop there. And you have to concentrate on building institutional capacity and teamwork as well as individual skills. The next one is to mobilize key participants. When you are mobilizing key participants, you have to share information, you share results and credit with partners, allies, and communities, and you have to keep everyone involved, motivated towards a strategic goal. Like I said, again, the next one is uh, mobilize key participants by sharing information with them, by sharing the results that you've achieved so, so far with them, and credit with partners, allies and communities and you have to keep everyone involved motivated towards the strategic goal you motivate them by giving them even incentives if you're able to talk to at least 10 people today towards our intervention you get ten thousand naira, or you get one thousand naira. that is one of the ways to motivate them and you have to mobilize them you just don't mobilize them and use and dump but rather you mobilize and motivate and the next is to manage and monitor programs. You have to check the programs that you've highlighted and you have to monitor the program output itself to ensure quality and consist consistency. By managing and monitoring this program, it ensures that you just don't only um, um, uh, delegate and abdicate, or rather you are, you are, you are monitoring, you are, you, are, you are delegating at the same time you are monitoring them. So while maximizing participation as well, so you have to equally track when managing a monitoring program, you have to track existing service statistics and conduct special studies using surveys, using focus groups, using observation and other techniques to measure output. And other techniques to measure output. So these are the things that we get to do. And the last one is to adjust program based on monitoring. You adjust programs based on monitoring. And in the course of doing this, you have to use data for monitoring to make mid cost corrections or adjustments in activities, materials, and procedures, and to, and to fine tune programs and components. So, when adjusting this program of these programs, 
you are not only you you won't only decide to just adjust some of these programs you have to adjust them based on the fact that you are monitoring the progress so far so in the course of adjusting or in the course of just like um writing uh, a movie and when you get to the location you find out that there are some things you have to take off this movie or there are some things you have to, you, you intend to add to to some of the scenes to complement what you've been doing so far so and the last one we'll be looking at under our p process is what is known as um evaluation and replanning evaluation and replanning evaluation and replanning so evaluation measures how well a program achieves its objectives have we been able to execute everything we intend to do towards this intervention have we dotted our i's and crossed our t's very well have we been able to say yes this program is free to fly so it can equally uh, explain why a program is effective or not when we are running our evaluation is this program effective or is it that we need to improve on it when next we come or we should improve on it right away by including the uh, including the effects of different activities on different audiences this program we intend that this program should be beneficial to the kids in this environment who are those benefiting from it at the end of the day so some program evaluation stimulates program improvement and redesign and this and, and, and by doing so it guides cost effective future funding allocation as well because when you evaluate you can say at the end of the day we're able to spend 70 million on this intervention at the end of the day we're able to spend 10 million there on this intervention so subsequently let us improve on it by maybe adding because of the economic uh, uh influence on it let us add maybe at least maybe a million era or two million era to this intervention that we intend to do uh, because with, with this evaluation you can be able to project the next cost for another intervention in another rural community and support advocacy uh, evaluation equally helps uh, support advocacy and equally fundraising it does this because uh, those you are likely to go and meet again to raise funds to come and help this particular rural community they will ask you questions how much have you were you able to raise the last time how much did you make let me see your budget let me see how much you're able to spend and let me see how uh how much i can equally contribute to the project so what are the steps that we get to take when we are doing evaluation and replanning number one is measure outcomes and assess impact number two disseminate results number three uh determine future needs and number four revise or redesign program revise or redesign programs so what do we do when we measure outcomes and assess impacts. What we do is uh, under evaluation is that many evaluations today measure outcomes to determine if the desired change has occurred in knowledge, attitudes, or behavior among the intended audience or in a given public policy relevant to the program. We make use of outcome this time around because uh, when we are doing a um, uh, a health belief model based uh, intervention. It is a long term effect that we often want to look at. We just want to, we don't want to leave it under our impact indicators only. We rather, want to look at it under the outcome indicator, which is the long term. So, more rigorous study designs assess impact, which links the change in outcome to one or more intervention activities. So, we need to ensure that when measuring this uh, outcome, uh, and uh, uh, when measuring our outcome, we probably need to assess the impact as well. So the next one is um, disseminate results. The result of the intervention program, we need to disseminate it through the media because we shouldn't forget we've made use of the media as well in the first place to create awareness of this intervention. When we are done with it, we should try as much as possible to go back to the same media to tell them our results so that uh, when next we want to go to another community, we can always say it is evidence-based, particularly if we have recordings of what we are able to achieve in the last intervention. So disseminate results, it is important that everyone involved be aware of the program's impact. So whether it is positive or not, share the impact results widely with partners, with allies, with stakeholders, with NGOs, government parastatals agencies, and so on, and even your funding agencies. You have to share the results with them. So that when next you go back to them, they are always 
willing to help to say at least you can do something you can affect effect uh, a behavioral or attitudinal change towards a, uh, a critical issue the next is determine future needs uh you determine future needs because uh, results uh demonstrates uh where follow-up is needed and where program activities can be extended so when you determine future needs we've been able to achieve this so far based on our results we can be able to do what is known as follow-up based on our results we can be able to extend further so next time that we want to do this this is what we intend to achieve this is what we're able to achieve for this rural community because of some of these deficiencies and based on the results we're able to to gather from their deficiencies then we have to improve on it on this and when doing that we have to go to the next stage which is revise and redesign revise and redesign program a good evaluation will show if the program is weak again a good evaluation will show if the program is weak and where it needs revision in design process materials or overall strategies and activities alternatively and sometimes simultaneously it will show what works and how to replicate positive impact when you revise it allows you to know where your where your weaknesses are what are the things that you need to improve on what are the negative uh, what are your cons that you can improve on your pros in future so members of uh, the NGOs, members of the intervention team or development communication team may have to return to the analysis stage if the situation changes. Markedly, if the, the situation changes markedly, like this, that is the situation changes in a great way, or if new causes are found for problems being addressed. Sometimes you might even be done with your situation uh, report and think you've addressed everything. By the time you are doing your evaluation, that is when you start finding out some things when the intervention program are taking uh, the center stage. That is, your intervention program has started working. They start seeing some things that will be coming out from it again. We've asked them to only drink this water. But in less than two hours, they are done fetching everything. And they will tell you they are waiting for NEPA. These are some of the things we ought to have taken care of at the situation report or situation analysis. But we are finding out some of these things in our evaluation, then you have to note it down. Doesn't mean you have to scatter everything and start all over. You only note it down for future uh, uh, needs. So that will be all for P process for development uh, communication. So I guess we'll have to move on to uh, what we have in our, what's the name? Uh, social ecological model social ecological model social ecological model so please can anyone run that by us again what we've been able to treat so far on that p process anyone at all aside from mr Inyodari Duano. okay i think i have uh angelia is in water again this night Hello, anyone? Yeah, everyone. Um, let me say, I think I can have a go at it. So um, this P process, um, we looked at um, the different elements of it. We look at analysis, um, strategic design, development and testing, implementation, monitoring, evaluation and monitoring. And then under um, the first one, which is analysis, we have to analyze two key important areas. The first is situation analysis, and the second one is um, communication analysis. And with situation analysis, we are trying to understand what the problem really is, trying to appreciate, I mean, trying to see what existing works have been done about it. We talked about the formative research, just to see what has been done in the past, what are the gap areas, and with that, we can come up with our statement of problem to say that this is the, um, this is the gap that we have found, and this is where the intervention will come. And then under this, um, we talked about <clears throat> we talked about different steps that we can that we're going to take under this um, situation analysis. First is to determine um, the the problem, as we said. The second will be to uh, identify um, what what has been done, as I repeated. Then um, we go to communication analysis, and here we're trying to get to understand the audience um this under this um communication analysis under this communications recordings analysis 
We are to look at um, participation analysis, social behavior analysis, and all of this is to actually look at the different inhibiting factors or enabling factors that can make our, um, I mean, our intervention work and that can make it fail. Then we move on to the second one, which is um, develop um, design and strategy. And here um, we said that um, this is the part where we bring in um, the different stakeholders. Um, and I think um, there, are diff there are kids um, areas here that we're going to look at. We're going to look at first is to establish the communication objective. What is the communication objective? What do we intend to achieve? And then we also get to discuss the scope of um, I mean, what we want to do also, then we develop program approaches. Um, we identify the theoretical frameworks, the theoretical background. What model do we want to approach? Do we want to use for this? Um, are we using the fusion of innovation theory? Are we using two-step hypothesis? Are we looking at the earth belief model? Um, we, are, we are to state the we have to clearly state the underlying assumptions of this theoretical framework because it will guide in our uh, uh, design eventually. And then the other one is we have to look at the, we have to determine the media channel that we're going to use. How best can we reach this audience? Don't forget that in, under um, communication and audience analysis, we've been able to, I mean, to identify the audience and to um, understand their social, ecological or social, social cultural um, factors. Um, that actually guide their behavior. So here, we look at how can we reach them. That's where we do our media planning and all of that. Then we go on to develop, um, I mean, to develop an implementation plan. And this is where we bring um, the art and science together. We try to look at, <clears throat> we, we come up with the products that we are actually trying to, to do. And then from there, we go to the next stage. And the next stage is development and testing. So this is where, so we've done the, 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 uh, the groundwork uh, in the first and second steps. So this is where we now, ask, okay, sorry. This is where we bring the science and the arts together. This is where we look at the statistics, the analysis, um, the, what we have found with research and all the analysis that we have done. So here, then we design our product. Um, we design what the program will be about. And under this stage, um, we, are, we have development and testing. So we develop the product, that's the first one. Then the second one is we test the product. We test the product by working with the partners and with the major key I mean, stakeholders to see um, how they will react to what we have done because they become like um, this, the micro, the micro um, audience because they are all stakeholders and then they are, some of them are community members too. So their reaction will influence, I mean, will expose the gap in what we have done. And then from, from that, we can go back to revise. We can go back to revise the plan. Then we can retest before we eventually print the, I mean, launch the, the, the plan. Then the next one will be implementation and monitoring. Now that we have the baby, I mean, well, now that we have the product, it's time to launch it. And here, uh, we said there are a few steps that we're going to take um, because we are with, so for product design. So because we are releasing in, because we are releasing a new car, we must come up with a, with a manual. And with that manual, we have to train senior mechanics so that they can know how to fix the new car. So here, we're going to train the trainers and we're going to work with community leaders and other stakeholders who are going to be involved in the implementation of the program. We're going to be training them. We're going to be monitoring and watching how the program is moving from point to point. And then we adjust the program along the way if we see that a part of it needs to be rejected. And that's where you talked about. It's just like when you're producing a movie, uh, when you're on set, you feel that something needs to be improved. You improve it and see how it works. And the final stage of the peer process is where we look at evaluation and replanning. So this is where we look at the outcome, the overall impact of what we've done. How much have we spent on it? How, what can we do? What are the weaknesses of this? What, what is the strength? Has this, has this program failed? Have, have we been able to meet the objective or not? And this could actually serve as the basis for getting funding for the next project, because now we have an idea of how much it might cost to, to take that kind of, um, to undergo that kind of campaign. And then I think that is what the peer process is all about, it's from what you told us. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Bayami Addis. I think you should actually take over the class for SEM. It shows your deep understanding, and I want to believe you're probably a proud student. You've been talking about product, product, product. Thank you very much for 
uh, for that. Much appreciated. Shows uh, quite a lot of us are uh, equally uh, following the class. Thank you very much. Uh, the next one we'll be looking at is um, uh, Auntie Bless you, dear, we don't do now. Some way they clap like this. All right, the next one we'll look at is uh, SEM. And what do we mean by SEM, which is Social Ecological Model? And what are the things that we use it for towards uh, C for D? That's like uh, Mr. Ridwan will call it. Uh, Social Ecological Model. Social Ecological Model. I want us to note um, four major things when we talk about Social Ecological Model. And this uh, looks more like a diagram that guides Social Ecological Model of Communication towards behavioral change. And it clearly has houses underneath uh, types of communication. And these types of communication include instruction, directives, non-directives, and uh, public. And under instruction, we have um, instruction with practice and reinforcement. Under our directive, we have what is known as uh, dissemination, uh, persuasion, and compliance. And under non-directive, we have dialogue, we have counseling, we have entertainment, we have education, we have social influence, we have communication for participatory development. And um, the last one, which is public, uh, has to do with advocacy regulation itself. And that is types of communication that has been uh, encapsulated in a socio ecological model of communication and uh, behavioral change or behavior change. So, but the four major things that I want us to take note of here is uh, individual. Uh, what is equally known as the social networks, we should equally look at community, and the last one has to do with the societal. Again, individual, social networks, community, and societal. So, social ecological model SEM is a framework on its own for understanding the multiple levels of social system and interactions between individuals and environments within the system. It is equally a model of communication for development approach, channeled towards development majorly. So the importance of identifying and incorporating social norms in program planning, partnership and capacity strengthening will equally be discussed in this class. Uh, uh, non-governmental agencies across the globe. An example is um, UNICEF. Often make use of the C4D because they support the behavior and societal change strategies that produce program and outcome synergies and positive change within a social system. And speaking of SEM again, it represents the social system on its own. And for every level in the SEM, there are corresponding communication for development approaches for achieving behavioral and social change. For achieving behavioral and social change. And it is what we have. Excuse me, please. Just a minute. Like I said, the socio ecological model represents a social system and it has levels. And it is these levels that are just uh, noted for, for us the other time. And that is when I, uh, I, I, I talked about um, your individual, your society, social networks, your community and societal. But the major thing we have to focus on here, we'll be looking at it from at least five different point of view, so as to further break it down. Five different point of view. So, so some of it have been expanded. So number one has to do with the individual, number two, interpersonal, number three, community, number four, organizational, and number five, policy or enabling environment. Policy or enabling environment. Again, individual, interpersonal, community, organizational, and then policy or enabling environment. And speaking of SEM, it is a theory-based framework for understanding the multifaceted and interactive effects of personal and environmental factors 
that determine behaviors and for identifying behavioral and organizational leverage points and intermediaries for health promotion within organizations. And there are five nested hierarchical levels of the SEM, which are the levels that I just mentioned. The individual, interpersonal, community, organization, and policy enabling environment. Now, if there is one thing that we can observe in our environment today, I'll be using Lagos State as an example. What can anyone at least give us one number one factor or number one critical issue that needs intervention in Lagos? One thing that needs intervention, anyone? When you wake up in Lagos, you find it, it is always there. Traffic. traffic. Lagos traffic. Lagos traffic. traffic. Thank you. Lagos traffic. Thank you very much. Now, has it reduced over time or not? I think it has. It with has. The new, with the new petrol price, yes. Good. With the new uh, uh, <laughs> premium motor spirit price, which is petrol, uh, it has reduced. Did the government, did the people plan for it? That subsidy no. will actually reduce traffic. Did we plan for it? No. None of us did. But we yeah. can say this form of SEM itself, social ecological model itself, was accidental. None of us saw this coming. I was in Lagos last two weeks. Uh, last week, I was in Lagos like three or three weeks back. And I saw the magic subsidy did. I was like, this is good. Maybe they should actually jack up the, the price a little bit up again. And let's see how many cars will move on the highway. Majority of us will actually go and make use of the blue rail line or, or any other means available. Now we're having so many bikes, personal bikes on the highway. Telling us that these social issues needs to be, needs to be contained. But how can we contain it? This is problems that is facing us. And like I said, the SEM itself is a theory-based framework for understanding multifaceted and interactive effects of personal and environmental factors that determines our behavior. Traffic is one thing that determines our behavior in Lagos. For those living in Ikorodu and working in Asuruleri or on the island, it affects their behavior. That social ecological change itself or social economic change itself affects their behavior. Someone living in Ikorodu will be forced to wake up as early as four o'clock or sometimes even 3.30. Run his bath by 5.30, they, they, they are on the way. And they still get to island, let's say around to eight or after eight, depending on the nature of traffic. So SEM is channeled towards that. It is a framework for understanding that multifaceted and interactive effect of personal and environmental factors that determine our own behavior. Now we can now use the same SEM to tackle it. These factors determine our behavior, and we equally use this factor for the identifying, we equally use SEM to identify behavioral and organizational leverage points. For the fact that the person who I had us understood the fact that, okay, Mr. Adisa is working in a, um, is yeah, he's, he's living in Ikorudu and is working on the island. Your organization will equally bring in, bring bring to bear a leverage point and serve as an intermediary between your between Ikorudu and island by telling you, okay, let us give you staff bus. You can join this staff bus in K2. So you leave Ikorudu at expected time, except the organization is now saying, okay, let us leverage on whatever problem you are going through at the moment, we'll bring the staff bus to Korodu. So whatever you all get, you all that are coming from Korodu, whatever time you get to work is what will be, is the time we'll believe, yes, indeed, you joined the bus and it was because of traffic. We can equally use SEM to identify that, identify our own behavioral and organizational leverage points and intermediaries for health promotion within organization. And there are five nested hierarchical levels to this. Number one is our individual. Number two is interpersonal. Number three, community. Four, organizational. And five, policy or enabling environment. And we have a figure for this that is a table for this. And it provides a brief description of each of the SEM levels. So the most effective approach to 
uh, uh, public health prevention and control uses a combination of intervention at all levels of the model. And that is when you only intend to make use of SEM for a particular health-related problem. So how best can we solve this problem? I worked in Lagos in um, 20, 2018, living in Ikorodu, working at Surulere. I could say in less than two, three months, I developed arthritis on my left knee and nothing concerned my boss. So you have to just be at work. But because of the traffic, having to stand, not that I'm butty or anything, living in the Korodu doesn't even show I'm butty. So, but there was no intervention in, in place. I had, a, I was developing, a, I was having a, arthritis on my left knee. But if there are to be an intervention program or an NGO that are into health related intervention program that are to come to Ikorodu, I will fit into it perfectly to say, see, come, I'm having arthritis. And they will say, okay, how best do you think we can help you? I don't want to go through this traffic. I need probably a personal car that, will, that can convey me to and fro, irrespective of the traffic. I know I'm fine. So we'll be looking at it um, from, from each and every one of the steps, the individual, interpersonal, community organization, and policy enabling environment. And for the individual, what you have under individual are just three major things. Number one, knowledge. Number two, attitudes. And number three, behaviors. Again, number one, knowledge. Number two, attitudes. And number three, behavior. Number one, knowledge, attitude, and behavior on that individual. For your interpersonal, uh, what is known as families, friends, and social networks. Families, friends, and social networks. Family, friends, and social networks. That is our number two, which is interpersonal. Number three, which is community. We have it as relationships between organizations. Relationships between organizations. Relationships between organizations. And number four, we have organizational. Organizational, organizational. And under, under organizational, we have organizations and social institutions. Organizations and social institutions. Organization and social institutions. And the last one, which is policy enabling environment, we have national, we have states, and then we have local laws, local laws, local laws. So we'll look at it one after the other. I won't take your time much on this. It's just for us to have an idea of what uh, SEM is all about. So for the individual, this has to do with the characteristics of an individual that influence behavior change, including their knowledge, their attitudes, their behavior, self-efficacy, developmental history, their gender, their age, religious identity, racial ethnicity, and so on. Anything that has to do with their demography is what we are to work with when it comes to the individual level. It is what we are to work with when it comes to what the individual level, at the individual level. While for the interpersonal, we have to look at the formal and informal social networks and social support system that can influence individual behaviors. So again, let me go back to individual. Like I said, we have to look at some of the things that will influence the behavior change of an individual when we are bringing about our SEM. Unlike our academic model, where we have to do the situation reports, and so many other things. We want to look at some of the things that will affect the individual, some of the levels that we find ourselves using SEM. As individuals, when we communicate with our peers, with our parents, and that is at interpersonal level, at the community level, at the organizational level, and the policy enabling level, what are the things that affect us? What are the things that influences us towards a particular intervention? And these things that influence us all has to do with our knowledge, our attitude, our behavior. The way we will react to news online is different from the way our parents will have to, to will, will, will react to it. 
while some of us will look at it to say this is just fake news, our parents are likely not to only look at it, but rather share the link with us to equally watch it because they believe in the media and believe everything that comes out of it, hook, line, and sinker. While we might say someone as individual, some of the things that affect us as individuals, if the government is trying to bring in about a change, the social uh, using the social ecological model, let's take for instance, uh, based on sexual orientation now, while some of us believe sexual orientation should just be uh, straight, there's nothing like bisexual, there's nothing like gay, there's nothing like lesbian, there's nothing like the LGBTQ. There are some people that not just this in their head to say, I am a man, but I think I am a woman. Meaning their sexual, sexual orientation is different. Even their gender orientation is equally different. And while you might be saying you are straight, you have someone else who will say they are bisexual. You have someone else who is gay. Now let us make use of that lesbian and being a gay as an example. The Nigerian government itself said a very big no to, to the American uh, during uh, Jonathan and o o Obama then. Where Jonathan said, whoever is found wanting of engaging in this type of sexual orientation, then they'll be jailed for maybe 14 years. That is an intervention. In terms of policy, you will still get there. But it has influence on us as individuals. For those of us that are straight, we say very good, Entaba Mukolo Pali for 14 years. While those that are actually gay will see that this policy you are bringing on board or this intervention you intend to bring to do what to take it and it's going to bring about even societal stigma and the next one which has to do with interpersonal and in the personal level we take it either formally or informal and these are formal or informal uh, social networks and social support systems that can influence individual behaviors even our peer groups influences our behavior towards a particular intervention which includes our family friends peers co-workers religious networks customs or tradition when there are some ecological models that are brought to us, the intervention that is before us, interpersonal level or interpersonal influence is likely to come to bear. And then it affects whether or not we can be part of it or whether or not the intervention will fit into our own lifestyle at the interpersonal level. And at the community level, this has to do with the relationships we have, among, the relationships among organizations, among institutions, among in, uh, informational networks, we are within defined boundaries, including the built environment. An example of such environment as with parks, village association, community leaders, businesses, and transportation. And for the organizational, organization or social institution with rules and regulation for operation that affect how and how well. For example, MNCH services are provided to an individual or group. While some people, uh, just like NHRS that we have here, is provided to only those who are civil servants, not provided for those working in, uh, in private establishments. It is an SME to cushion a particular issue in the society, and that is our health care, our health system. Saying if your wife is given birth, instead of paying 250,000 naira for, for CS in a private hospital, when you go to the general hospital and you are an NHRS get to cover you, or you are under NHRS, then you have to pay a minimum or a token of just 2,500 or 25,000 now, which is 10%. That's the amount they will get to collect from you. Or you are buying a drug of 25,000 naira, they tell you you have to pay only 2,500. So these are some of this, this intervention. But at the organization or social institution levels, there are rules and regulations for this, for their operation, and it affects us as well. Meaning it cannot go round, but the government has ensured that this policy is in place for every organization to fit into it and they expect every individual to equally fit into it. And the last one is a policy or enabling environment. At the local, state, national, and global uh, level, laws and policies, including policies regarding the allocation of resources for maternal, newborn, and child health and access to health care services, restrictive policies, e.g. high fees or taxes for health services, or lack of policies that require childhood immunizations. These policies are there. They are meant to cater for us. They are all forms of intervention. Now, when we are using it for C4D, how do we fit in to all of this? And having a detailed understanding of the fact that communication for development is equally systematic, it is planned, 
It is evidence-based approach to promote positive and measurable behavioral and social change. C4D is equally an approach that engages communities and decision makers at local, national, and regional level in dialogue towards promoting, developing, and implementing policies and programs that enhance the quality of life for all. Many government are expected, uh, the, the government is expected to provide all of these amenities, these basic amenities. I've listened to people that have traveled to the diaspora, UK, for instance, which is the new Lagos today. They will tell you the things that we pray for in Nigeria are actually their own basic amenities over there. I'm closing from work and I'm, beg I'm telling God, really I'm closing, God, let there be light when I get home. Let there be power when I get home. Meanwhile, over there, it is just basic. You just have to, it is there for you to make it. You just have to pay for it. So our government often ensure that uh, uh, they provide these things, but it doesn't get to, to us. Even if it get to us, they still take out of it. And there's a way they even siphon some of the funds that are meant for this intervention. So the C4D approach for this SEM uses information and dialogue, which is based uh, dialogue-based processes and mechanisms to empower populations, especially those that are marginalized and vulnerable. An example of this is the, 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 the effects of BRT on individuals the effects of the BRT buses on individuals. And when Fashola started with this, quite a lot of houses went with it. And today, Lagosians can as well tell you they're enjoying the use of BRT. Now, it is the railway line, uh, blue rail line that people are, people living between Marina and Maitu are equally working on, uh, uh, using as a means of transportation. I mean, they are meant for us to cater for us at the individual level, at the interpersonal level, at the community level, and our organizations as well are equally to tap into it. And when they tap to it, we at the individual level, at the interpersonal level, and at the community level should be able to benefit from it. Because it is there's, there are policies on ground already that is specifically designed for us to be major beneficiaries for. So C4D also in this category aims to strengthen the capacity of communities to identify their own development needs, which is why today we have what is known as commun uh, community development association. Just because we identified one thing, despite the government policies that are available to us, doesn't mean this government that will do everything for us. So the community development association will also come together to say, why don't we also uh, create gutter? for water to have its own channel. Instead of allowing water to come into our, before government will come to us, it's going to take quite a lot of time. So C4D aims to strengthen the capacity of communities using SEM to identify their own development needs, assess the options and equally take action. Meaning they don't have to wait for the government to do this for them, rather they take the bull by the arm and assess the impact of their actions in order to address remaining gaps. If there are other things that they are supposed to do at the community level, then they will come together. This is what we've been able to achieve so far. This is the next thing that we intend to do. So see for the approaches and tools facilitate dialogues between those who have rights to claim and those who have the power to realize this right. And that is where the policy makers the in and the individuals, the interpersonal and the community levels get to meet. And this equally has its own figures as well. But for, for the sake of the class, I'm going to be stopping here tonight. And I hope I've been able to touch uh, quite a lot of things uh, for the class, both for SEM and uh, P process. So thank you very much for your time. I think it's 10.15 uh, already. Thank you very much, sir. Okay. We have uh, Mr. Bayomi has raised. Okay, please. Do you have any question, Mr. Bayomi? Yes. Um. Thank you very much, sir, for for this. This is quite um enlightening. So, and, um, I I've read um this um social ecological model before. Quite interesting. The overlapping um levels and how they blend in. And then I've read um some of the theories of behavioral change. And I just want to know for clarity's sake, like the P process and the ACADA process, they were clearly um, 
different planning strategies or approaches. Uh, is this ecological model, it was classified under planning models here, but it sounds more like a theoretical framework to understanding how people behave and what actually, I mean, what how people behave and what um, brought people into changing their attitude. So I just want to see, I just want you to please clarify, can we really classify the ecological model under planning model or part of um, behavior change theories? All right, thank you very much. Uh, we can classify the socio-ecological model under both. One, it is a model. It is equally a planning model. I will look at the planning aspect of it. We'll be looking at it from some of the things we know about already. Uh, that is number one, advocacy. We'll be equally looking at it. Uh, we'll look at it from the aspect of social mobilization. We'll look at it from the aspect of social change communication. And the last one, we'll look at it from behavior change communication. Let me run that again. If it's going to work for you as a planning model, you can take it from the angle of advocacy. You can take it from the angle of social mobilization. You can take it from the angle of social change communication, behavior and behavior change communication. And the reason why I'm looking at it from this four angle is because speaking of advocacy, the policy or enabling environment level of the SME itself consists of policy, legislation, politics, and other areas of leadership that influence health and development. And that is when it comes to advocacy. And what are the strategy that is used? The strategy used to address this level of social system is advocacy itself. And advocacy is an organized effort to inform and motivate leadership to create an enabling environment for achieving program objectives and development goals. And the purpose for this ad ad advocacy, again, uh, on the other hand, is to promote development of new policies, change the existing governmental or organizational laws, policies or rules, and ensure the adequate implementation of existing policies. Another aspect uh, we look at it from again, which is our number two. SEM, using, when we use it as a, as a planning model this time around, and using it, it from the aspect of advocacy. Now, the advocacy has to do with those that are the policy makers. With advocacy, you can use it to redefine public perceptions, their social norms, and equally the procedures towards their social norms. And number three, you can use this advocacy to support protocols that benefit specific populations affected by existing legislator, legislations, norms, their procedures. And number four, you can use this advocacy to influence funding decisions for specific initiatives. We are not politicians, but the, the mini apex level of power, the, or the mini level of power, I can't use apex, which is the red chamber, but our own level here, the House of Assembly, there are some policies that the legal state government will want to, to advocate. And they want you to know about it. One that is going on now, as at, uh, I think three days ago that I read on X, is the fact that the Blue Rail Line has refused to add Yoruba into their uh, mode of telling people where to stop and even announcing when the train will start uh, when the when the, uh, the, the the train will start moving and the last bus stop and so on. Now they are to include it as part of their policies. Do you know why? They are only trying to promote the development of their own local language. And they have to advocate for it. So advocacy is one key thing under, under, under this. And there are three common types of advocacy. We have the policy advocacy. And the policy advocacy is used to influence policy makers and decision makers to change legislative, to change some social, social norms. The way Nigerian police used to harass us before is different from the way they harass us now. It's because of the outcry of the Nigerian youth, and that has had a positive effect on the policy advocacy of not only the Lagos state government, but the Nigerian government. So our own decision equally influences policies make our policy makers and these decision makers to change certain legislative, to, to change certain social or infrastructural elements of the environment. 
which includes the development of equity-focused programs. One of the equity focus programs, uh, I think I, I gave an example this afternoon when I was having another class with uh, some of your colleagues, and that has to do with um, domestic violence. And these are they, are, they are already NGOs that will advocate for this. If you lay your hands on your, on your wife, then you are in trouble because they're trying to have some level of what equity. She is not your, your slave. She's not your errand girl. She's rather your wife. So you shouldn't be beating her. So they focus on some of these programs. Not only programs like bringing people together, husband and wife together, and start talking to them not to bring it, beat each other, but rather they take some of these programs to even media houses. And they won't only go alone to sensitize, they go along with lawyers so that you can know the consequences of whatever action you are taking. So, and equally, this policy is equally, this advocacy equally affect corresponding budget allocations. If they don't tell us how much they allocate, we won't know, but we can equally influence it. So, the amount you allocated to this uh, uh, constituency or to this, uh, 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 what do we call it, uh, local government area, we are not seeing the efficacy of that budget here. We can influence those policymakers to open the amount to tell us the, the expected amount. Number two, uh, the, the, the second type of advocacy is the community advocacy. And this helps to empower communities to demand policy, social or even infrastructural change in their environment. When you, for those of us that are living in a Greek, or those that know a Greek very well, we call it family bus stop. The moment you drop at a Greek, you are facing Ishao. Now, from a Greek to Oriokuta or Okeoko, the road is very bad. They're only constructing one part of it. It's been a while I've been there. I think Ilea or so. The other part is still under manageable construction. But at some point, they stopped. The, the road had been under construction since the days of Ambody. At some point, they stopped. And people had to come out to say, we want this infrastructural change in our environment. You have to do this road for us. And if not, we won't deliver a Kurodu for you in your next election. And I guess immediately after this election, they are, I take her to go back to the field again and give themselves timeline to say, in the next six months, we'll be completing this project. And the third type of advocacy is the media advocacy. The media advocacy allows us to do what it, it, it is used to enlist the mass media to push policy makers and decision makers towards changing the environment. And who are those that can ensure that the mass media do this, that can ensure that the mass media push these policy makers? It is you and I. Without, there had never been any day that you go on air and then they'll tell you today there is no news. One thing is always happening on each and every, each, in short, every second something is happening. So there's nothing like no news. Now, if we come together to start talking about uh, uh, have a consensus online, on Twitter, for instance, uh, which we, we engage, uh, engage what's known as civic engagement over a particular topic, before we know it, the government will start taking action on it to say, this is what people need at this time. We can see what is happening already. Uh, the justice from Mubad, justice from Mubad every minute, topping uh, uh, the number one trend in Nigeria as at yesterday. Only that Liverpool and other football matches took over. And I'm pretty sure by tomorrow, Tuesday, uh, tomorrow, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, it's going to come back again. And before I knew it, looking at Tunde Ednot's uh, page this evening, the, the CP well, in Lagos State is already looking into the, to the issue. And they are saying already, even if it's going to take them to exhume the body, they will to conduct their own thorough investigation. So this media advocacy relies mostly on us. We are the ones to push policymakers through the media. And when we push the media, the media will set the agenda by framing everything we want. They frame it using our own narratives. We shouldn't forget the media itself serves as the watchdog of the society, not just being the watchdog alone, but rather reports back to the government as well what the society is equally saying and equally report the government activities back to the society. So that is it for advocacy. Please, I will still on. Can I still continue? I'm seeing someone yes, sir. left. Yes, sir. I'm very deep. Thank you. All right. So uh, moving on, and uh, I think um, uh, Mr. Mr. Biomi, and that is it when we are using SEM for, for planning now and not looking at it from the theoretical aspect only. Okay. That is it for planning. And I, I mentioned, uh, I think, five, uh, four or five major things the other time. I think advocacy, 
social mobilization, social change communication, and behavior change communication. I want to use it, uh, the next one, which is uh, social mobilization. Social mobilization, uh, using SEM for social mobilization, itself is a continuous process that engages and motivates various intersectoral uh, partners at national and local levels to raise awareness and demand for a particular development objective. We come together, mobilize ourselves together. We can see the effect of this mobilization, physical mobilization, nationwide mobilization during NSAS. We are not sectors, but we as individuals could actually get this done. So when we use social mobilization, it is a continuous process on its own, like I said, that engages and motivates various intersectoral partners. Now, these sectoral partners at national, it could be at national level, it could be, it could be at local level, to raise awareness. At the local level, it could be you and I, to raise awareness of and to demand for something, a particular development. We saw that during NSAS. So these partners may include government policy makers, it could be decision makers, it could be community opinion leaders, it could even be our own uh, celebrities, it could be bureaucrats, it could be technocrats, it could be professionals in any field, it could be lawyers, it could be religious associations, individuals, and so on, and even community members coming together to mobilize themselves together to advocate for cert certain developmental change. So this communication approach focuses on people and communities as agents of their own change. We are our own change. It is not APC change, but we are our own change. And we emphasize on community empowerment. These are some of the things we request for when we come together. For community em empowerment, uh, for enabling, env uh, enabling environment, for uh, enabling environment, and for capacity building, and so on. So we don't just uh, mobilize ourselves and then say we just want to have party, but rather when we mobilize using SEM for social development, it most cases it is always achievable and we have seen this uh come to play all the time then we have five faces over five faces for uh, almost five faces for social mobilization process itself number one phase is to build rapport and share knowledge and that is when we mobilize ourselves socially number two is to solve problem analyze problem and take action or, or plan our action, analyze problem, and then take action towards that problem. And then number three, we organize uh, organize uh, organization building. At the end of NSAS protest, we are able to see uh, a new political party on on Twitter coming up on Twitter, YPP, Youth Political Party, on so many other things that came up. And number four, capacity building. Capacity be number five, action and sustainability. And number three, we have to look at aside from social mobilization, we talked about advocacy. Number two, which is social mobilization. And number three, here, uh, when we're using SEM as a planning model, we, uh, another thing we should follow is social change communication. This is one thing we should engage in. Social change communication is equally purposeful and iterative process of public and private dialogue. It could be public private dialogue with debate and negotiation that allows groups of people uh, or groups of individual or communities to define their needs. Aside from defining their needs, it allows them to identify their rights and collaborate to transform the way their social system is organized, including the way power is distributed within social and political institutions. Just this 2023, we witnessed the social change communication. It was a house to house, door to door affair. Have you gotten your? Do you have your PVC? This is our own right now. This is a time to throw away this, throw, to throw away this government. This is a time for us to change the, the the chain of power in this environment. And we see the effects of people coming together using SEM this time. And SEM has to do with aside from the theoretical aspect of it. In terms of planning, it's not just about rural change or communities. It's it's something national. It's a global change sometimes. And it depends on how well people can mobilize, can come together to effect that social change through communication. So this process is usually participatory in nature and is meant to change behaviors on a large scale. And it is meant to eliminate, in all cases, harmful social and cultural practices and change social norms and structural inequalities. All of these things are obtainable. We've seen these things play out in Nigeria a lot. Which is why today, like I said this afternoon, development communication is not just, it is not just a course on its own to be studied. I will, I'm even glad they had to break it down. It's part of the courses under mass communication. It is something 
very broad. So while social mobilization focuses on creating a sustaining action-oriented partnership to create an enabling environment for positive health or for positive issue in the society, it equally focuses on creating ownership of the process of change among individuals and communities. Tinumbu is claiming total ownership of APC today. That is why he is the president. The moment the change that he advocated for had come to play through social mobilization, through in order to effect social uh, change using communication, then he sees himself as the king. And that is where some of this self-entitlement of his came from. And the next one is, um, I think we'll, we'll discuss advocacy, we'll discuss uh, social mobilization, we'll discuss uh, social, uh, uh, com is it communication change? Yes, social behavioral change. Is it social behavioral change? Yes. Okay, the next one is what? Um, I think I'm, I, I stopped writing at the third one. Um, okay. Social behavioral change. We've done social mobilization. Um, behavior. I think we stopped that behavioral change. Okay, okay. We've taken uh, the last one we took now is social change communication. And the last one is behavior change communication. Behavior change communication. What does, uh, what do we use behavior change communication to do? This behavior change communication focuses on individual knowledge, focuses on their attitude, focuses on their motivation, their self efficacy, skill building, and behavior change itself. And um, it equally works through interpersonal communication, uh, the mass media, the social media campaigns, and so on. And it is at the behavior change communication that uh, we get to note this takes place within families, within individuals, at the interpersonal level, where people get to come together to, uh, to discuss uh, of the social change that they've witnessed and how it has affected them as individuals. So behavior change communication is equally the strategic use of communication to promote uh, positive uh, policy outcomes that have come to play. So BCC, which is also known as behavior com uh, change communication, is this time is theory based, is research based, and it is equally an interactive process that is developed to that is developed developed and ta uh, developed tailored messages and approaches. And we use variety of population appropriate communication channels to motivate sustained individuals and community level change in knowledge, attitude, and behavior. When, uh, when we are done, uh, we, we, when we are done with all of this our advocacy, our social mobilization, our uh, social change communication, we want to see the effects on the behavior of people using SEM this time around. So and using this business approach, it can help us, uh, it can help to stimulate community dialogue. These streets, we we'll start talking to that streets to extend the, the, the change that they are witnessing. How were you able to achieve this? Today, we can say not just only at, at community level, even at global level, Malaysia today picked up their own pump canal from Nigeria here because they needed to, to start producing one and they equally learned the process here in Nigeria. Now they are producing in large scale, large scale and large and quality scale way more than Nigeria, Nigeria does. Secondly, it equally increased knowledge uh, when, when the behavior is setting and it, uh, the behavior has been affected. It increased knowledge, it promotes attitude change. Uh, for example, about uh, let's look at the, the using SEM for the importance of breastfeeding after uh, for, for six months. When you, you, you sensitize people, you advocate, you, you bring about social mobilization, bring mothers together. You equally make use of the SEC, which is social change communication. You make use of that, then it's going to have effect on their behavior. So an example of it is about the importance of exclusive breastfeeding or hand washing with soap. And uh, the, the BCC as well also promote attitude change. For example, about the risk associated with not vaccinating a child against pneumonia or about not making use of seat belts while driving. Well, number four, it's equally, it, 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 it uh, reduces stigma around exclusive breastfeeding. While some people will say, I cannot breastfeed a child for, for six months, that's too long. I cannot breastfeed for two years, kilo shelling. Some people, will, uh, uh, when you make use of this SEN this time around, is going to reduce that stigma. So I hope I've been able to, to break this down, Mr. Bayomi. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir. It, it's really, really nice. 
Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much for having me. I hope I've not been able to, I've not bored every one of you with my lecture. Thank you very much, sir, Mr. Shalala. We appreciate uh, your teaching so much. Uh, so tonight, uh, I know uh, we would always have the cause to call you again, and I know that you would uh, oblige us. So uh, please, I would want us to have uh, two different uh, votes of thanks. Uh, one from a female participant and the other one from a male participant. So uh, please, Madam Persin and Mr. Abayomi, please kindly do the vote of thanks uh, on the participant uh, behalf. Thank you. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, let, let go first. Please let her go first. Let the woman <laughs> go first. <laughs> Uh, okay. Good evening, Mr. Sholola. Thank you so much. On behalf of my cosmate and I, would like to thank you for your time. Thank you for coming through for us, even though we didn't pay you, but you, you took your time, your resources, you created the link for us, you're recording the class for us, and you spent quite a lot of time with us on Thursday, and today again, we are grateful. We can't pay you, we can't repay you, but we pray that God Almighty will repay you and will pay you in multiples of food. And by God's grace, we're going to do you proud as development communicators and even for our forthcoming exams with all that you have taught us as we revisit them, go through them. I know that we'll do well. So we're grateful and we'd like to say, like Mr. Ridwan has said, if we have any cause to call you again, we plead that you oblige us once again. Thank you very much and God bless. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Much appreciated. Thank you. Um, so I'm not I'm not going to repeat what she has already said. Um, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Um, one thing you've done is to be able to actually um break it down, uh, break the course down. I wasn't here on Thursday, but there were glowing tributes that were said um on the platform, and I said, Okay, I'm just gonna be here today, and it's not a disappointment. Um, you've been able to actually um, crisscross the different um, subtopics and the models and planning and everything. And you, you, you really made everything so easy. So we want to thank you. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you for everything. Um, we hope that beyond just um, writing the exams, we hope to work together in the field of developing communications in the next, um, in, the, in, the, in, in, the, in the years ahead. Thank you so much, sir. Um, please give our regards to your family. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bayomi. Uh, Mrs. Um, apologies, I forgot the name. <laughs> so thank you Blessing. very much, uh, Blessing. Mrs. Blessing. Thank you very much for having me. I'm just a small boy. You just like Mr. Ridwan. You see Mr. <laughs> Ridwan, that you see me. So uh, thank you very much for allowing me to share knowledge with you guys. It's This is me just talking to, to my colleagues as well. I uh, really appreciate the time. So. I could see the, the the presence online and um, shows quite a lot of us are committed to this program. Mass communication is growing and we are not growing just as mass communication as a field anymore. Uh, we've grown from being mass communication to more than um, over, over eight other disciplines, uh, development communication inclusive and uh, other disciplines that are still uh, uh, not only just coming on board, but has been approved by the uh, by the federal government. Uh, quite a lot of us uh, might say being a lecturer is one of the uh, most tedious thing to do. Yes, it is. Uh, this is me on line ten forty, and uh, the only luck you guys had is because my family is not around. If not, somebody will have you'll have been hearing someone's voice uh, in the background. But we now have today advertising, broadcasting, development, communication studies, film and media studies information and media studies, journalism and media studies, mass communication, public relations, and strategic communication. The reason behind this is all of this, and the reason why I'm always willing to help out when it comes to lectures like this is simply because those that did not even study mass communication are the ones taking over our jobs today. You find them in radio stations, uh, being uh, on OAP, on air personality, 
And when you ask them questions, what did you study? Yeah, I studied medicine, I did engineering because they could speak English. They for net for net, the American accent without going to the embassy and so many other things they could get to do practical wise. They, they've taken the jobs away from us. So what then do we have to offer? And I'm really glad that the discipline itself had been broken down so that whoever is to come out to say, I'm a journalist, then you should be certified uh, to, to, to be a journalist. I've been in the field as well, not in Lagos precisely, not that doesn't pay me, I enjoy the money, but it's about impacting knowledge. It's about sharing knowledge with others. It's about ensuring that this discipline, you know, of course, if we close our eyes, before we know it, it is someone who studied, studied engineering that will come and be teaching us mass comm. And then they start hearing engineering, mass communication, and so many other things like that. So I want to appreciate each and every one of these efforts. I want to appreciate your time, giving the respect, uh, the honor, most importantly. I met Mr. Aridwan just uh, once, and uh, he informed me of the fact that he wants me to take this class. It was an honor. He doesn't even know whether I'm an Olodo or not. He just, let me just ask this man whether to win, what are they teaching them in Summit University? I'm a lecturer at Summit University once again, um, where we bring practical and the theoretical aspect of it to life. So please, let each and every one of us get to work assiduously towards this field and impact, that's positive impact on others. I can't be a motivation speaker after this long talk already, but I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you for your time and God bless everyone. Good night. Thank you so much. Good sir. night, sir. Thank you. I'll sir. send the recording Gmail. to once it is ready. I think Gmail will have to help me process it. I'll send the drive, the, the link. That of afternoon is ready, Mr. Erdogan. So I think oh. I'll have to upload it this night. Okay. I will share you share the link with you. So whoever misses the class tonight can also go back to it and then uh, All right, sir. listen back again. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you so much, sir. Have a wonderful Thank you, sir. All right. Good night, sir. All right, good night. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Good night.